by saying good afternoon. Uh, and I'm Julie Johnson, the co-director of the internship program for the National Council for Preservation Education, also known as NICP. Uh, I want to welcome all the interns, the fellows, our panelists, students, MPS staff, and others to NICP's summer webinar series. With COVID, NICP's annual orientation meeting held in Washington, D.C. has become virtual and a multi-week, one hour long webinar series instead. I hope you'll register for our other sessions if you haven't already. And they take place on Thursdays in July. Uh, the next one is July 15th, then the 22nd, and then the 29th, all at 3 p.m. I'll provide links to these webinars to anyone who doesn't have them. Just send me an email or drop me a note in the chat. Uh, they'll all be also be listed on the screen at the end of the presentation. Uh, today's webinar is a uh, introduction to the National Re Preservation Program at the federal level. And I will introduce our first uh, speaker panelist in just a few minutes. First, I want to say that this session and all of our sessions is being recorded and it will be posted on Nick P's YouTube channel. You can find us when you search YouTube under National Council for Preservation Education, our full name, National Council for Preservation Education. Second, I want to explain what, what the National Council is and does. NICP is a nonprofit tax exempt organization founded in 1978 with members representing colleges, universities, and trades programs in historic preservation and architectural conservation. Its mission is to encourage preservation education and facilitate the exchange of ideas about the academic field and the profession. NICPE has several programs and projects that support its mission. From its inception in 1978, NICPE has created and promulgated academic standards for post-secondary programs in the field of historic preservation, programs that award degrees as well as certificates. In addition, if you're a NICPE intern, most of you will also be familiar with one of our websites, PreserveNet. This is where NICP internships are listed and where you go to apply. It's also a jobs board for all types of employment in the historic preservation and related fields like archaeology, museums, uh, conservation, uh, design and architecture, landscape architectural, architecture, uh, architectural history, and so on. It's also a repository of online resources covering a broad range of interests from GIS and heritage tourism to sprawl and traditional trades. You can find PreserveNet at preservenet.org. Since 1992, NICPE has sponsored an internship program in cooperation with the National Park Service. This is what most of you will know about NICPE. There are about 100 NICPE interns working this summer with more having worked in the spring and more will, even more will start in the fall for a total of about 250 to 300 working this year. Almost 6,000 college students and recent grads have participated as interns in the past 30 years. In fact, you'll meet some of our alumni among our presenters today. For more information about NICP's other programs, you can visit the organization's main website nicpe.us. That's ncpe.us. The last thing I want to do before getting to our topic today and our first panelists is to introduce my co-moderator and the Youth Programs Coordinator at MPS's Cultural Resources Office of Interpretation and Education, Paloma Velazny. I work very closely with Paloma to administer all facets of the internship program. And I know she wants to tell you a little bit today about the organizational structure of MPS and how it fits into the larger Department of the Interior. So I'm going to turn things over to Paloma with your first screen uh, slide. And here it is. Great, thank you. Um, 
Again, hi everyone. My name is Paloma Belazny and I'm the Youth Programs Coordinator for the Cultural Resources Directorate at the Washington office. And I do work with Julie closely in administering the NICP uh, internship program. Thank you all for joining us. I'm glad to see interns from various uh, programs join and from across the country. So thank you for joining us and thank you to our speakers in advance. Um, I'm going to provide you with just a snapshot. It's really brief overview of how the Department of the Interior and the National Park Service is organized, just so that you can better place um, our speakers and yourselves organizationally um, if you're working with the Park Service this summer. So here, here goes the snapshot. Um, Julie, next slide, please. Um, the Department of the Interior, as it says on its seal, was founded in 1849 and currently has about 70,000 employees and is comprised of 11 bureaus and seven offices. The Park Service is just one of those 11, bu uh, 11 bureaus listed on the, the slide. Um, some other large ones include the Fish and Wildlife Service um, and the Bureau of Land Management. You might be familiar, familiar with those. Next slide, please. In 2018, the department was reorganized from many different regions um, recognized by the different bureaus into 12 unified regions. Um, and these regions encompass regions to be used by all bureaus. Um, so as you see on the slide, there are 12, um, and that's why you see um, the numbers by some of our speakers' names in the, um, in the, the, the advertisement for, um, for the program. Next slide. So administratively, the Park Service operates within a framework um, of the Park Service's former regions, we'll call them legacy regions, seen on this slide. The Park Service has seven of these regions plus the Washington office. So to see which DOI regions fit within the boundaries of these regions, you have to overlay the DOI map onto the this NPS map. And I couldn't find such a combined map, so you will have to imagine it. Um, each legacy region has one or several regional offices within its boundaries. And the Midwest here is highlighted in green because you'll hear from Alicia Cerny, who is with the regional office in the Midwest region, which is regions three, four, and five. Next slide, please. Great. There are currently 423 units of the National Park Service. It grows every year. Although there are 19 different naming designations like National Park, National Historic Site, National Monument, National Battlefield, it goes on. Um, we very often at the Park Service call all of our units parks in conversation. This amazing map that you see has all 423 units listed and it's available on nps.gov if you're interested. Um, and in addition to managing 423 units, the Park Service admin administers just a number of programs that implement the Park Service's role in the National Preservation Program. These programs for the most part are mainly administered out of the Washington office. Next slide, please, Julie. Right. Oh, that, that is much smaller than I had imagined. Um, well, the Washington office, or WASO, is a separate office from regions. And you can see here on the org chart, or very uh, minimally, that um, WASO uh, organizationally starts the director of the Park Service and then uh, has various deputies and various associate directors who they manage national programs, national policy, and, and budget. Um, and the speakers you'll hear from the WASO office work under the Cultural Resources, Partnerships, and Science Directorate, as do I. So it's just one directorate under the Deputy Director for Operations. And with that quick overview, I'll turn it over to Julie for our first presentation. Okay, thank you so much. 
and here is uh, today's uh, agenda. Uh, I really want to thank you for being thorough uh, as uh, even though you were brief, you were very thorough, Paloma. Um, and I want to thank you, Paloma, also for making all the arrangements for the webinar series. Um, I really appreciate it, uh, all your hard work on this and on everything. It's great to work with you. On to our speakers. I will briefly introduce each of them at the beginning of their presentations and then go from there. And our first speaker today is Jim Gabbert, who will introduce us to the National Preservation Program in general, as well as talk about the National Register and National Historic Landmarks Program in the Washington Support Office. Uh, Jim is a historian with the Park Service, a position he's held for over 13 years. He previously worked for the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office and Indiana Landmarks, the statewide preservation nonprofit. He has an MS in Historic Preservation from Eastern Michigan University and degrees in History and Geography from Indiana University. So with that, Jim, let's hope that you can take over the screen. Thank you, Julie. Um, let's get to this. And, uh, by the way, the storm appears to have hit my house now. All right. Okay. Please. Not coming up. Okay. Are, are we there? I'm not seeing it. Okay. Good thing we practiced this. Also, Jim, if you could speak up a little bit. Sorry about that. That's right. Uh, we, we do have a storm rolling in right now. I knew there would be. Ooh, yeah. Right. You see it now? Yes, I do. This is fantastic. Okay, let me uh, get this going here. Slide okay, um, my job as I work on this is to talk to you a little bit about the whole federal preservation program uh, writ large, which is a, a heavy load for seven minutes. So I'm hoping that I can get this thing to share properly. Um, okay, is this getting better? We have your back, back slow. Okay, here we go. Um, the, the federal preservation program came about uh, gradually through a number of laws that uh, directed the federal government to do certain things or to take certain responsibilities. So with the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, uh, historic preservation became an official policy of the federal government. All federal agencies have a level of responsibility to promote preservation in one way or another. The law also put an emphasis on including the public in decision making. But before the NHPA, there were other laws that laid out the foundation for the federal preservation programs. So we're going to take a, look, a little quick look at some of these. 1906, the Antiquities Act was signed into law by President Theodore Roosevelt. The law grew out of decades of concern in the late 19th century for the preservation of archaeological sites. There was concern about theft and destruction of archaeological sites, and the Antiquities Act was a way to protect these sites at the federal level. The Antiquities Act authorized the president to designate national monuments on federal land. The act set precedent because it asserted that protecting historic sites was in the public interest, and the act still stands today as the basis for preservation public policy developed through the rest of the 20th century. 1935, the Historic Sites Act declared it national policy to preserve for public use historic sites, buildings, and objects of national significance. The act set forth the parameters for the Historic American Building Survey, which still exists. 
The act also established what is now known as the National Historic Landmark Program and authorized the federal government to carry out preservation work, including maintaining museums through the National Park Service. So this act designated the National Park Service to carry out national preservation program. Then the big one in 1966 was the National Historic Preservation Act, which is so significant, it gets its own slide and it expands the role of responsibilities of the federal government beyond just federal properties. So the 1935 Act directed the Secretary of the Interior through the National Park Service to undertake various programs, including the Historic American Building Survey and the National Historics. It was the National Survey of Historic Landmarks, the National Historic Landmark Survey, which eventually became the National Historic Landmark Program. This delegate, delegation placed the NPS at the forefront of the federal preservation policy and set stage for greatly expanded responsibilities that were to come in 1966 with the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act. It was signed into law on October 15th. It has since been amended and supplemented, but it remains the basis for the majority of federal preservation policies and practices came into being in the midst of a push to expand government roles and responsibilities in the environment at large. So on the same day it was passed, the Department of Transportation Act, Section 4F of that act, you might jobs in the future working in compliance. Also, three years later in 1969, the National Environmental Policy Act was enacted. The NHPA has been amended a number of times and it has been a vehicle for preservation incentive programs, the Federal Investment Tax Program to encourage preservation in the private sector. This uh, tax act has been amended a, a number of times but remains the primary federal incentive for preserving historic income producing properties. So the preamble of the National Historic Preservation Act says rather poetically, Congress finds and declares that the spirit and direction of the nation are founded upon and reflected in its historic heritage. The historical and cultural foundations of the nation should be preserved as a living part of our community life and development in order to give a sense of orientation to the American people. Um, so it, it's a, uh, an inspirational and aspirational law but in its essence, it also created a policy program for federal agencies, wherein the roles and responsibilities of federal agencies are defined. It serves as the basis for many of the National Park Service programs that Paloma mentioned, and you will learn more about in this and in future webinars. The act directs federal agencies to integrate preservation into their policies and their programs. These are the sections of the act that are primarily served to direct agency actions. They, they apply to the actions of federal agencies and to the management of federal properties. Those are section 106, section 110, uh, which are the principles that we're going to we'll hear more about. So how do these work? Uh, they primarily um, affect agencies that control and use federal land, which include Department of Defense, NASA, Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, the Park Service, the Veterans Administration, and the nation's realtor, the General Services Administration. But it also applies to agencies that provide federal funding that include housing and urban development, federal highways, uh, Department of Agriculture, the Park Service, and even the National Endowment for the Arts. And it applies to agencies that provide permitting for activities. And this includes the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, FERC, the Federal Energy um, Regulatory Commission, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, and even the Federal, de uh, federal Depart not Department, Deposit Insurance Corporation, which is FDIC, which licenses banks and ATM. So if you're gonna put an ATM somewhere, you have to get a license from the FDIC. Section 
reservation program properties that they own or manage, to list their properties in the National Register, and to the extent possible, preserve and use their historic properties, and to include the potential effects of agency actions on properties outside their control. Section 106 directs agencies to take of their undertaking on any district site building structure object that is included in or eligible for inclusion in the National Register. Also created by the NHPA was an independent federal agency. The, or by the NHPA was the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Uh, it's given le legal responsibility to assist federal agencies in their preservation efforts and then to ensure that they consider preservation during project planning. The ACHP serves as federal policy advisor to the president and Congress, recommends administrative and legislative improvements, and reviews federal programs and policies to promote effectiveness, coordination, and consistency with national preservation policies. And you're going to learn more about this agency later from someone who works at that agency. The NHAPA and uh, the Historic Sites Act delegated many programs and responsibilities to the National Park Service. Here at the Park Service, we have programs that look at listing and evaluating, creating the criteria for doing so. This includes the National Register, the Historic American Building Survey, Historic American Engineering Record, Historic American Landscape Survey, and the National Historic Landmarks Program. The Park Service is also in charge of maintaining the Secretary of Interior standards. And there are a whole bunch of standards. The, the most the one most people know are the standards for rehabilitation, but there are also standards for survey, the standards for archeology, span the standards for restoration, et cetera, et cetera. We're also in charge of the Secretary of Interior's professional qualification standards. Uh, which set a bar for the education and experience of people who are working in the fields of preservation who are doing work on behalf of or in conjunction with the federal government. Uh, we also have offices that give technical guidance. National Center for Preservation Technology and Training is one. Uh, the, the Tax Act program as well produces all sorts of technical bulletins on uh, and guidance on proper preservation techniques, the physical aspect of preserving things. And then uh, finally, my colleague James will talk about the funding aspect. The National Park Service um, is the conduit for any number of grant programs that Congress throws our way, including the Historic Preservation Fund, which funds state historic preservation offices, tribal offices, uh, but also specific funding sources like tribal heritage grants, maritime heritage grants, Save America's Treasures grants, and myriad others. So that's the basic intro to the Federal Preservation Program. Um, do we want to entertain any questions now or should we wait? Uh, why don't we continue on, uh, especially since we seem to hear you a little bit better? Uh, before the next storm goes through, uh, if you don't mind. Not at all. Hi, I'm Jim Gabbert. You may remain know me from previous presentations like the one I just did. My real job at the National Park Service is as a historian, and I work for the National Register of Historic Places program and occasionally help out on the National Historic uh, Landmarks program. So I've got about seven minutes to fill you in on 55 plus years of the National Historic, uh, National Register of Historic Places. So well, let me see what I can do. We're looking at programs that are similar but different. Uh, by two different laws, the Historic Sites Act of 1935, which sets up the National Historic Landmark Program, and the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 which created the National Register of Historic Places. So, 
all National Historic Landmarks are listed in the National Register of Historic Places. This is uh, set forth in the law in 1966. Uh, as we noted, 1935, the NHL program was started. So there were lots of properties that were designated National Historic Landmarks prior to October 15, 1966. They were all incorporated into the newly created National Register of Historic Places. So they're the same, but different. And how we get to each is different. They're un, uh, created by two different laws. They're governed by two different um, sets of federal regulations. 36 CFR Part 60 for the National Register, 36 CFR Part 65 for the National Historic Landmarks Program. So what is the National Register? I'm going to talk about it. Uh, knowing that all of this also applies to the National Historic Landmarks Program. What it is, is a planning tool used by the federal government, but useful also to state and local go governments as well. It is an integral part of the federal environmental review, both for sections 106 and 110, but also through cultural environment aspect of NEPA and section 4F of the Surface Transportation Act. It's it's formal recognition that a property is important in our history. It's also valuable documentation that sometimes out, outlives the listed property. What it can be also is a tool for economic development, particularly through the federal investment tax credit. It can be a centerpiece for community identity, typically in historic districts. How many of you have seen the signs as you enter uh, small towns that are proud of their historic districts. It can give a source of pride to property owners, to neighborhoods, and to entire communities. It can be used for educational purposes, for marketing, for destination planning, and it can serve a lot of other potential functions. What it isn't, it isn't a guarantee of preservation. It isn't a guarantee of funding. It does not restrict the use of private property. If you own a house that's listed in the National Register, so long as you abide by local laws and ordinances, the federal government cannot tell you what to do with your property. If you want to demolish it, you can demolish it. You can add on to it, you can paint it pink and burn it down. So it doesn't require anything of you. You don't have to open it to the public. And it also doesn't include a nice bronze plaque, although NHLs are eligible for plaques, but there are very few of those. And most people uh, who get their properties listed in the National Register and they want a plaque, they have to buy it from themselves. So what are the basics? The National Register of Historic Places is administered by the federal, uh, by the National Park Service under the auspices of the Secretary of the Interior. There is a person known as the keeper of the National Register. And then there are folks like me who work for the keeper and do the actual work. We are authorized to accept nominations from only three sources. The three nominating authorities are state historic preservation officers, federal preservation officers, and tribal historic preservation officers for those tribes that have an agreement with the National Park Service. And we all work in the regulations that are found in 36 CFR Part 60. The NHL is a federal program under the auspices of the Secretary of Interior who has delegated much of the responsibility to the National Park Service. But only the Secretary of the Interior can designate a National Historic Landmark. Reviews and recommendations are made by a committee of the National Park System Advisory Board and eventually the National Park System Advisory Board itself. So the subcommittee is known as the National Historic Landmarks Committee. They make a recommendation to the Park System Advisory Board, who then makes a recommendation to the Secretary of the Interior, who then has the authority to designate an NHL but the secretary may designate an NHL without it going through that process as well. Nominations come from many sources, uh, including congressionally authorized theme studies or from public interest. And the regulations that govern the, the process are found in 36 CFR part 65. 
So here's some numbers to throw at. The National Register of Historic Places, there are four criteria for evaluation. There are five property types that can be listed. The National Register recognizes three levels of significance. And as of this week, there are more than 96,500 listings in the National Register. And by listings, that can be an individual resource, you know, one building, or it can be a historic district comprising thousands of buildings. Uh, some of the largest concentrations of districts we have are in New Orleans. The Midtown Historic District had over 8,000 resources within its boundaries. National Historic Landmark Program has six criteria for evaluation. It has the same five property types. There's only one level of significance. By definition, all NHLs are nationally significant. And there are more than 2,600 designations as of this week. So a real quick look at the criteria here. Those that are underlined are those that are um, unique to the NHL program. And these are boiled down. So really it's uh, properties that are associated with events of significance in our time, associated with persons significant in our time, some NHLs that represent some great ideal in American history, philosophy, and thought. Um, properties that embody the distinctive characteristics of a period type, method of construction, works of masters, basically architecture, the, the physical qualities of a resource. Uh, the NHL breaks our, the National Register, is down into another one, which is collective importance of groups of resources, or what we re refer to typically as historic districts. And then both of them look at the information potential, uh, typically used for archaeological sites, but not necessarily reserved for archaeological sites. So the property types, buildings, sites, or structures, sites, objects, and districts. And these property types are written broadly enough that virtually everything can fall under one. For the National Register, we have National, National Historic Landmark Program has everything nationally significant. Uh, but the National Register also looks at state level of significance, or even by far, most listings are at the local level of significance. They're important within a community. So what is eligible for listing or designation? It's a property that meets one of the five property types. It's significant under at least one of the National Register or, or the criteria for evaluation, whether it's National Register or NHL. Uh, a property that retains sufficient historic integrity to reflect that significance. There are seven aspects of integrity. We're not going to go into them all, but they are flexible enough that they can apply to many types of resources. What's most important is, is identifying what aspects of integrity are most important to the significance of the property itself. So something that's significant under criterion A or one for events is going to be looked at differently than one that's going to be looked at for its architectural importance. So uh, we have a form. So how do we know whether a property is eligible? You know, bureaucrats, we have forms. There are official things you have to do. What goes into the forms is what informs us of why a property is important and worthy of preservation. The nomination provides us with sufficient information to demonstrate that the property is important in some aspect of our history and that retains sufficient integrity to reflect that significance. So what goes into a nomination? There's a lot of check boxes, but really the meat of it is a description of the property as it is now at the time of nomination, a description of how it has changed over time, and an analysis of how those changes affect the historic integrity of the property. The other aspect is a historical examination of a property within a context. It provides a reason argument for why a property is important using a comparative evaluation. So the three things that are most important to remember when writing uh, a nomination are the context, the context, the context. That's really what it's all about. 
in the grand scheme, we're talking about a process. Anyone can prepare a nomination, but only a nominating authority can actually nominate something, and that process is outlined in federal regulation. National Park Service has a limited time to act upon the nomination, and our actions include uh, listing it, returning it, or rejecting it. We reject very, very few. We return a small percentage, less than 5% of nominations that come in are returned for substantive or technical correction, and we get about 1,200 nominations a year. For the NHL, Again, it's a process. Anyone can prepare one, but most are done by hired professionals. The, the documentation standards are higher for an NHL. NPS staff review and comment and assist preparers. The nominations are also peer reviewed by subject matter experts outside of the NPS. When they're ready, they are scheduled for the advisory board and eventually the uh, Park Service Advisory Board. And in the end, it's the secretary who decides. So that brings me to a quick overview and I, I can field any questions if we have any time left. Julie, I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah, I think uh, we don't have any time left, but we'll wrap up with questions uh, at the very end. How about that? If that's okay. Okay, um, I actually am gonna have to leave after Alicia, so. Oh, okay. Well, uh, we can, we're going to share your information, Jim. So uh, if people have questions, they can get in touch with you. How about that? Yeah, please. I, I'll respond to all emails. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Jim. That's great uh, and thorough. We really appreciate your uh, discussion about the sort of larger uh, preservation program and um, NHL uh, and National Register. So uh, going on to our second speaker, speaker uh, is Alicia Cerny from the Park Service's Midwest office and who works with the National Register and National Historic Landmark Landmarks at the regional level. Um, and hopefully Alicia, you can uh, take over from me just to give you a little bit of information about Alicia. Um, she is an architectural historian uh, working in historic preservation partnerships for interior regions three, four, and five in Omaha, Nebraska. And in addition to working with National Historic Landmarks, her responsibilities include coordinating documentation of threatened historic buildings and assisting in the transfer of federal historic surplus property. She holds a BFA in historic preservation and MA in architectural history from Savannah College of, Architect of Art and Design. And with that, thank you, Alicia, for taking over. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Yes, and we can hear you. Excellent. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, hello from Omaha. Let me get it going. There we go. I work in the Historic Preservation Partnership, and we assist the Midwest National Parks to preserve, protect, and share the history of the Midwest and its people. And this is our 13-state region. And this is our regional office in downtown Omaha. Omaha has been in the news a lot lately because of the College World Series for baseball and the city hosted the swim trials too. So that's kind of exciting here. But my colleagues and I, we also implement the National Park Service's role in the National Preservation Partnership. So our name emphasizes the partnership aspect of programs that primarily extend beyond the national park boundaries and reflect the diversity of programs that we administer such as the National Historic Landmarks Program, the Historic Surplus Property Program, Heritage Documentation Programs, and the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act. We're also engaged with numerous uh, park-related concerns, such as Section 106 reviews of park projects, review of park planning documents and studies, and providing technical assistance. And sometimes these overlaps with NHLs that are in our national parks. So the National Historic Landmarks Program uses the skills of Park Service staff in the region to guide the nomination process for new landmarks. We work with citizens uh, in our area of the Midwest, and we also assist existing landmarks. This is one of my uh, National Historic Landmarks that I work with, Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House in Chicago. 
and we have the authority to uh, to monitor National Historic Landmarks and to maintain a continuing relationship with the owners. So we use periodic site visits and uh, contacts with the state historic preservation officers and other means to determine whether landmarks retain their integrity, also to advise owners concerning accepted preservation standards and techniques, and to update our administrative records on properties. And this is kind of a breakdown of the NHLs here in the Midwest region. I think we have around 471 here in the region. The Historic Surplus Property Program is a partnership program to preserve and reuse federal historic properties listed on or eligible for listing on the National Register. So state, uh, county, and local governments may apply to obtain these historic buildings once used by the federal government at no cost and to adapt them for new uses like Hall County did for this federal building in Grand Island, Nebraska. So transfer properties may be used for a wide variety of public facilities or revenue producing activities. Um, private and not-for-profit organizations cannot acquire property under this program, but they may enter into leases with recipients of historic surplus properties. And I believe we have around 33 um, properties transferred to date in our region and around 113 nationwide. The National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act is an amendment to the National Historic Preservation Act that provides for the disposal of federally owned historic light stations that have been declared excess. So they're transferred at no cost to federal agencies, um, state and local governments, nonprofits, educational agencies, and community development organizations. But these entities must agree to comply with conditions set forth in the act of uh, certain things that they need to keep for the property and a, a management plan for the property. So prior to this program, White Houses could be transferred through the Historic Surplus Property Program. So they are, there are similarities but some differences with the program. And also, I work with the Heritage Documentation Programs, which administers the Historic American Buildings Survey, which is the federal government's oldest preservation program, began in 1933, and its companion programs, the Historic American Engineering Record and the Historic American Landscape Survey, both of which came later. So documentation produced through the programs makes up the nation's largest archive of historic architectural engineering and landscape documentation, and it's housed at the Library of Congress. So the mission is to record historic sites and landscapes through measured and interpretive drawings, written histories, and large format black and white photographs and color photographs. To share the workload, uh, the Park Service offices in the region oversee different sources of this documentation. Federal agencies must produce documentation to the program standards for building structures and landscapes that are listed or eligible for listing in the National Register to mitigate adverse effects of federal actions like demolition or substantial alteration. So regional offices oversee this aspect of documentation, which is then submitted to the DC office for final review and inclusion in the collection. And every year our office hires, you know, one or two summer interns. I was in fact a NICP intern back in 2005, not with my program now, but with the Cultural Landscapes program. But the main project for one of our interns is our annual National Historic Landmark newsletter called Exceptional Places. And it's a glossy publication designed in InDesign and then professionally printed that is mailed out to our National Historic Landmark stewards in the region and the state historic preservation officers, as well as park superintendents in the region. So it has a circulation of around 800. And that's one of our, our main outreach programs to stewards. The NHL program is also on uh, Facebook and Instagram. And this is kind of like a collateral duty, but I did post on there today because in fact, a few hours ago, um, the National Historic Landmarks program released, is pleased to announce the release of the new theme study called Civil Rights in America, Racial Discrimination and Housing. And this theme study is a, it's part four of a five part Civil Rights in America series, which uses the provision of the 1960s Civil Rights Acts as a framework. And you can go right to our NHL page and download the document from the link that I posted. 
And that is all that I have. I maybe wrapped up a little early. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to try and get back to gallery view and thank you so much. That was fascinating information. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, your, your thorough review of uh, everything in your, your, um, your region. And it's always wonderful to hear from outside of Washington, DC. That's great. And especially wonderful, I didn't know that you had also been a NICD intern. So I'm adding you to the list. We're now up to 6,001 that I'm aware of. No, no, I'm, you, I'm sure you were included. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, James Alvey, uh, who's also in the Washington Support Office, just like uh, Jim. But he will be talking about uh, grants from the perspective of the state tribal and local plans and grants division uh, of the National Park Service. And, okay, James is a former archivist turned grants manager. Uh, he graduated from the University of Mary Washington with a BA in Historic Preservation. And of course, I'm proud to say, started working at the National Park Service as a NICP intern. So James, take it away. Like I said, I can tell you that uh, NICB is a good way to get in the door. And if you scratch at the system long enough, it lets you in. But I will talk to you guys about state, tribal, local plans, and grants, or as we refer to it, steel pig, because state, tribal, local plans, and grants is quite a mouthful. So as Jim mentioned, we primarily operate the Historic Preservation Fund. There's a great many things we do, but this is the majority of our work. The Historic Preservation Fund was authorized by Congress at 150 million every year. It is composed of offshore oil lease revenue, not tax dollars. But the date Congress has not yet ever fully appropriated all 150 million in a single year. Closest we've got so far was last year with 144 million 300,000. We'll see whether or not we actually get there sometime soon. So the purpose of the Historic Preservation Fund is to fund the Federal Preservation Partnership. And then also as well, any additional programs that con preservation programs Congress so chooses. The most, what this originated out of was funding those state historic preservation offices. The National Historic Preservation Act mandates the existence of state historic preservation offices and what they do to be able to have that federal preservation partnership and uh, the cust uh, custodial stewardship of historic resources across the United States. So Congress pretty quickly, immediately realized that funding was needed to be able to actually have these state historic preservation offices operate at anything like the level we would hope they would. So they threw some money at the, the uh, Secretary of the Interior right away in 1966, and then later eventually codified that into the Historic Preservation Fund. So the HPF gives monies to state, tribes, and certified local governments. The tribes came along later than states did, and certified local governments also came along later than the states did, as the National Historic Preservation Act was amended to include other entities in the Federal Preservation Partnership Program. So these annual grants, they fund the operations and the activities of these offices. So personnel, office costs, but also as well architectural or ar archeological survey or preservation and uh, all that done either in-house or by contract. It also allows for and even mandates subgranting. So certified local governments, what are those? Those are actually, that's a National Historic Preservation Act term that is very specific. It is local governments 
the State Historic Preservation Office has certified for participation in the Federal Preservation Program. That gives those local governments access to technical preservation support and also as well to funding. The National Historic Preservation Act mandates that 10% of the fund that a State Historic Preservation Office receives in its annual grant must be subgranted to certified local governments. So that guarantees them some funds. Depending on your state, that might be very competitive or not very competitive. Some states have hundreds of certified local governments. Some states only have a handful. So depending on how many of the, and how active the CLGs are, there can be, it can be a competitive program at the state or not terribly much of a competitive program. The funding differential is uh, as appropriated by Congress. Currently, states tend to receive about a million dollars and the tribes receive on average about $70,000. The, so that you can see there's a quite a large disconnect in that the, the offices get funded much more for their operations, whereas Tribal Historic Preservation Offices are usually funded for a person and a truck. What we do have in addition is competitive grant for programs. These are as appropriated by Congress and they tend to come and go. The one that's been around the longest is the Historically Black Colleges and Universities Grant Program that originated in the 1980s and has come and gone since but it is still around getting funded at the moment. Next one was the Save America's Treasures program, which uh, came about in 1999. Then it did have a break between 2010 and 2017. And then African American Civil Rights was our newest, first new grant program since those two. Uh, excuse me. Tribal Heritage and underrepresented communities have also been around much longer. Tribal Heritage actually predates the, the annual grants for uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Offices and underrepresented communities was originally uh, uh, appropriated in 2014. Also as well, still specifically a competitive program only for states, uh, State Historic Preservation Offices, Tribal Historic Preservation Offices, and uh, local certified local governments. These programs range between either have preservation project elements or history project elements, or how we usually divide them. Preservation is for bricks and mortar, getting out there and actually doing something to preserve a site. They uh, usually have a cap about $500,000. History projects, generally speaking, uh, they fund survey and documentation, interp and education, oral history documentation, or collections conservation. And those are usually about $50,000. Some of our grant programs here in Competitive allow for both preservation and history projects. Some of them allow only one or the other. To briefly run through them, African American Civil Rights is both preservation and history. history Black colleges and universities is only preservation. History of Equal Rights, only preservation. Paul Bruin Historic Revitalization Grants, only preservation, and very specifically for subgrant programs. You apply to that one to then subgrant out all the money. Save America's Treasures is preservation and history. Tribal Heritage is history, and underrepresented communities is history projects. The eligible eligibility aspects of all of them vary between all the programs and they also have their own individual purposes, which is why they're their own programs. Eligible applicants range from state agencies, tribal agencies, local governments, educational institutions, and nonprofits. Very much missing from there is for-profits and private individuals. For those types of entities, they generally have to find one of the eligible applicants to apply on their behalf. We also very much tied through the National Historic Preservation Act to the other federal preservation programs. 
So for example, a lot of the time for all of our preservation projects, it must be tied to the National Register of Historic Places or the National Historic Landmarks Program, be listed in or eligible. We also, these are our competitive grant programs that occur annually and also as well are generally open. We also have disaster funding for any named disaster that had a presidential declaration that Congress so chooses to appropriate funds for. So it's very hit or miss. As you can see so far down at the bottom, we've been funded for Katrina, Sandy, Harvey Irma Maria, and Florence U2 Michael. All of those are hurricanes. So Midwest flooding, wildfires, earthquakes, tornadoes. So far, Congress has not appropriated funds for those. They're also very specific. They are only uh, for states and tribes in those presidentially declared disaster zones. So it is very, very, very specific who's getting money, for what, and how much. That money is then used for staffing because now you have a whole bunch of federal money, not even just the Historic Preservation Fund, but FEMA, HUD, Department of Agriculture, all hitting the ground after a major storm. And that's all, it's all federal undertaking. So it requires Section 106 review. And so this money is for staffing up and also system development for that. Then we also have repair of storm damage, survey, and disaster planning. Those are three major types of grant programs. We have our two, our state and tribal annual grants, which are, again, non-competitive, and our formula awards. They very specifically, every state and tribe gets a certain amount that receives based on a formula that has square roots and percentiles in it. Um, then we got our uh, seven competitive grant programs, and then this disaster various disaster grant programs. You can find a lot of what our grant programs have done to date by looking up our programs in the National Park Service Integrated Resource Management Applications. A lot of reports, a lot of plans and specifications, a lot of the products that came out of our grants are available on there if you wanna go take a look at what we have done. You can find us here at nps.gov slash stlpg. You can also email us at stlpg at nps.gov for any questions you have, or you can contact me, and I will happily answer any questions you have or any questions you have about getting hired in the National Park Service. Thank you much. That is my presentation. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, James. And uh, I don't see any um, questions so far. Um, so we'll go on to our last speaker. Uh, and uh, hopefully, Judy, you can take over the screen. Uh, we'll go a little bit over, but uh, uh, go ahead and show us everything you've got from the Advisory Council. I uh, want to introduce Judy Rodenstein, um, Internship Program Coordinator at the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. She'll provide the introduction to the Advisory Council. And uh, Judy uh, is involved with research, development, and promotion of agency initiatives at the Advisory Council, such as climate change resilience and traditional trades training. She also develops and coordinates the ACHP's internship program. So with that, um, hopefully, Judy, you can take over. Can you hear me okay? Yes, great. Okay. Hopefully you won't have a lot of thunder in the background. <laughs> um, the ACHP is a small independent federal agency that's created by the National Historic Preservation Act. We promote the preservation, enhancement, and productive use of our nation's diverse historic resources and advise the President and Congress on National Historic Preservation Policy. The Advisory Council represents participants in preservation at local, state, and national levels, including federal agencies, state historic preservation officers, and tribal historic, 
Historic Preservation Officers. Federal agencies are represented on the Council by the Departments of Interior and Agriculture and seven other federal agencies designated for terms by the President. The Architect for the Capitol and the President of the National Trust for Historic Preservation also sit on the Council. Citizen, uh-oh, <laughs> I got ahead of myself, but we'll just go with it. Citizen and expert members, including our chair and vice chair, are appointed by the president as our governor, a mayor, and a Native American or Hawaiian representative. Observers including, observers, including the National Alliance of Preservation Commission, participate to enrich the expertise and the viewpoints that are represented around the table. A small professional staff, serving here in Washington supports the council. The Advisory Council on Historic Preservation strives to ensure that federal agencies implement their work in harmony with the National Historic Preservation Act. Section 106 of the Act requires federal agencies to consider the effects of projects that they carry out or approve or fund on, federal, on historic properties. The ACHP has published regulations that guide federal agencies and other participants in Section 106 review process. Section 106 review applies not only to federal agency projects on land or buildings or other properties that federal agencies own or manage, but also protect project, also applies to projects that receive federal grants, require federal licenses, or need federal permits. Section 106 reviews are carried out only when there's a federal involvement and the project activity is of a kind that has the potential to affect historic properties. Federal agencies have two responsibilities under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, to take into account the effect of its actions on historic properties and to provide the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation an opportunity to comment. The Advisory Council on Historic Preservation Regulations provide more specific direction on two agencies on how to do these two things. The National Register's criteria are important for Section 106 because only listed or eligible properties are afforded consideration in the review process. Section 106 review is a public process that allows for the involvement of diverse stakeholders. Section 106 requires that federal agencies work with others to gather information and make decisions during the review. State or tribal historic preservation officers are important partners in almost all reviews, and the agency must also consult with federally recognized Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations. Local governments and other individuals or organizations with a legal, economic, or historic preservation interest in an undertaking can get involved as consulting parties as well. Judy, are we supposed to be seeing, uh, are you advancing the screen? I we're, am. We're, we're not seeing that. We're still on the first screen for whatever reason. So um, I, I am seeing them advance on what I'm looking at. Um, hmm. Okay, let me try something. Okay. Um, Well, I can't get to my actual screen without. Oh. We're, we're seeing that first slide. You're still seeing the first slide. Yeah. Okay, let me try. Hey. Now you're not seeing the first slide, but you're not seeing slideshow view either. But I will, okay. just, I will just leave it that way. Okay, great. Thank okay. you. Um, okay. The federal agents. Oh, I did that already. Okay. Sorry. Consultation is key to the review. It offers a seat at the table when the federal agency discusses its plans as they relate to historic properties and it affords consulting parties the chance to share relevant information, ask questions of the federal agency, and suggest alternatives. Resolving adverse effects and developing memoranda of agreement is where the process can get exciting and creative. 
The federal agency is responsible for compliance with the law and all the decisions made in the course of the review. The ACHP's regulations establish a four-step process for handling any effects that may result that may result to historic properties. First, agencies identify and locate potentially affected historic properties in consultation with other stakeholders. Then they assess whether the project may return, may result in harm to the qualities that make a property significant. Finally, they negotiate measures to avoid, minimize, or mitigate any adverse effects. Section 106 involves balancing project goals with different values and viewpoints about historic properties. For instance, Haleakala is a location with strong religious and cultural significance for Native Hawaiians. Observers from other backgrounds might not recognize this landscape as one of sacred importance. Beyond case-by-case -case review, the ACHP also works with federal agencies on a larger scale to address their Section 106 responsibilities. Alternative approaches, such as tailoring the Section 106 review process for a group of similar undertakings or for an entire program, can streamline routine interactions while focusing effort on more complex projects. The ACHP participates in working groups to advance administration priorities, such as rebuilding the nation's economy. The ACHP contributes to this effort by identifying further efficiencies in carrying out Section 106 reviews for infrastructure projects, including clean energy and broadband development, while promoting the full and effective engagement of all key stakeholders who have an interest in the historic preservation implications of infrastructure development. The agency is uniquely positioned to improve environmental reviews for infrastructure projects through better coordination of the Section 106 process the National Environmental Policy Act, and other environmental statutes. The ACHP issues guidance, for example, a policy... Oh, just a minute. I'm sorry. We've gotten out of order here. There we go. The ACHP issues guidance, for example, a 2018 policy statement to guide federal, state, and local government entities facing decisions about management or disposition of controversial commemorative works. These may be memorials, statues, markers, or other landscape features honoring historical figures or events. Through, through this guidance, the ACHP seeks to promote informed decision-making and responsible stewardship of controversial but ne nevertheless historically significant commemorative works. The ACHP statement acknowledges that it's essential for decision makers to directly confront history's difficult chapters, consult broadly with the public to ascertain contemporary community views, consider a range of management alternatives, and promote public education regarding all aspects, positive and negative, of the nation's history. There are many resources available for more information about Section 106 and the National Historic Preservation Act. Browse the ACHP's website, download a copy of our Citizen's Guide to Section 106 Review, which can help you use Section 106 as a tool to protect historic resources in your community, or consider enrolling in a training course or webinar to learn more. Section 110 of the National Historic Preservation Act emphasizes how the federal government should show leadership in preservation and in the stewardship of historic properties in its care. Federal agencies have their own historic preservation programs and work with the various programs and entities created by the National Historic Preservation Act, such as the National Register, the State and Tribal Historic Preservation Offices, and the Advisory Council. Section 110 requires the agencies to appoint a federal preservation officer as an agency-wide resource. They must survey and document historic properties they own or manage. An important part of the ACHP's work is assisting federal agencies in improving their preservation programs. To that end, we work with agencies and highlight best practices in its preservation stewardship. Among other things, Executive Order 13287, called Preserve America, 
emphasizes improving federal agency planning and accountability. It requires all federal agencies to report on their progress to the ACHP, which compiles a report to the president, including recommendations every three years. But there's more to the ACHP than Section 106 review and a focus on federal agency preservation responsibilities. The ACHP participates in federal working groups dealing with other, with the intersection of historic preservation with many policy issues, including affordable housing, urban revitalization, sustainable development, disaster recovery, and building a more inclusive preservation program. We have also promoted the benefits of preservation, such as community revitalization, economic development, and heritage tourism through the Preserve America program. The ACHP is participating in the planning for the upcoming America 250 celebration in 2026, helping ensure that historic preservation and its value in sharing the full range of American experiences is on the agenda. Five years ago, the 50th anniversary of the 1966 National Historic Preservation Act was an opportunity to celebrate the accomplishments of the preservation program and to identify goals and strategies for continued improvement and relevance. One important goal is to inspire and involve the next generation of preservationists. The ACHP works with partners to create new opportunities for young people in the historic preservation field and to help build a more inclusive preservation program. Preservation in Practice, a program developed by the National Park Service, the ACHP, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation Hope Crew, connects historic preservation and conservation through a joint project with historically black colleges and universities. The project aims to bring African-American young professionals into historic preservation and related career paths. Current architecture and construction engineering students in historically black colleges and universities learn about the important role they can play in preserving heritage through travel to national parks, hands-on hands -on experience, and learning from historic preservation professionals around the country. Salish Kootenai College in Montana is the only college in the nation that offers a degree program in tribal historic preservation. The ACHP, the college, and the ACHP Foundation entered into an agreement to provide educational and professional growth opportunities to students in the college's tribal historic preservation and tribal governance and administration degree program. Goals for that partnership include mentorship, internship, networking opportunities, and visits to Washington, D.C to meet with ACHP and National Park Service preservation staff. The ACHP also convened a traditional trade training task force to address the growing need to train a skilled workforce in the specialized carpentry, masonry, and similar skills that a workforce in, in historic preservation requires. The task force considered key issues regarding preservation trade including credentialing, apprenticeship, and curriculum development, and developed recommendations for federal action. For more information on the ACHP, you can check out our website, our YouTube channel, our publications, Facebook pages, Instagram, or follow us on Twitter. Thank you for your interest, and feel free to contact me at the email address on the slide with any follow-up questions. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. And thank you to everyone for hanging on um, and, and uh, hanging on past our technical issues. Thanks so much. All right, yeah, so sorry there. I lost some uh, information at the end there. Uh, thank again, I echo uh, Paloma. Thank you for um, uh, sticking with us and hopefully I can still get on the screen um, the uh, uh, but I don't think I can, uh, oof, anything that I was going to do. But um, thank you all for participating. Uh, I do want to mention again the uh, webinars that we have, uh, not next week, but the week after, uh, starting on the 15th and uh, then continuing on the 22nd and then on the 29th, 3 o'clock. Uh, and again, contact me uh, if you want information about this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, everyone's participation. Yeah.
Thank That's you. Great. Thank you to our speakers. And on the 15th, join us again. We're going to be um, hearing about museums and NAGPRA. So our NAGPRA specialists and um, museum practitioners. And uh, the next one will be cultural landscapes. Uh, we'll be hearing from some parks and regional offices. And then the last one is all about archaeology. Right. Thank you, Julie, for setting these up. Thank <laughs> you, Lisa, Judy, Jim, James. Thank you. Yes, it was wonderful. Thank you so much for all that information. It was great. And please do contact us if you have any questions. We are more than happy to um, talk about more of all of this um, and answer any of your questions. All right. Great. Thank you again.